I'm really very happy to be here to be the part of this amazing, amazing festival. So thanks, Macmillan and Will, for inviting me. Uh, second time, actually. And I have the impression that this year we have been talking a lot about teenagers, how their brain work and how their brains work and, and about the emotions. Just has just talk, talked about emotions and the motivation, how, how much they, they are correlated. And I'm going to take you a little bit further on in our development and talk about next stage, actually, about our transition to adulthood. I guess that many of you are still in your 20s, so actually it can be a little bit about you, you and also about your students. So um, I would like you first to think a little bit about the lives of your grandparents, great-grandparents, great when they were in their 20s. Could you just recall some memories? How do their lives at that age compare to your life? Or you can think about your parents. Did your parents become adults earlier or later in their lives compared to you? Yeah, and what happened to change the twenties so much between that time and our own? And also, I would like to invite you, Mary, maybe to think about your own life. Of about your own life, do you already feel like an adult? If you feel it, why? And if you don't, why not? You know, some people never really grew up and they never become adults, but this is another issue. So I'm not going to talk about it today. Uh, but um, it's really a very important question. What does it mean to be an adult? And what does, when does one become an adult? Is it marked by a certain age, role, or experience? What do you think? You can, you can chat together about that because I think um, everything has changed and Traditionally, we had some typical markers of entering to adulthood, which are um, explored by psychological uh, research and, and literature. So there are like nine indicators, uh, traditional markers, indicators entering to adulthood. First one is achieving autonomy. What do we mean by that? It's just trying to be an independent person, yeah? establishing oneself. It's connected with establishing identity. So what is identity? It is a huge issue uh, and we can talk a lot about identity, but it's just a simple question. What are your likes? What are your dislikes, your preferences, your philosophy, philosophy uh, in life? Next one, developing emotional stability. So uh, it means that we, in this period of time, we're trying to become more emotionally stable. Because emotional stability is in a way a sign of maturing. Finding intimacy, so um, forming some long-term relationship partners. Becoming a part of group or community. When you become an adult, you you become a, a member of different organizations. Sometimes people become members of uh, political uh, parties or some local community, different things. But we're just choosing which community we want to belong to. Establishing a residence and learning how to manage a house, very important, learning how to budget, how to keep a home maintained. Also a, a, a sign of being a, an, an adult and making some marital or relation, relationship adjustments. So you then decide when you want to parent, or are you ready to get into the relationship? And of course, becoming a parent and bringing up children. So they are the, just the the signs or typical markers um, entering to adulthood, which were uh, working in the past. And I would like you now to think to what extent do you think this early adulthood developed because there are somehow developmental tasks have changed in the last several years. And how might this task vary by culture? Can you see any any difference because development is a process and you know that we it's not like that there suddenly a person becomes an adult at a certain age as in fact actually it may take even longer nowadays to become an adult so it's been proposed uh, that there is a new stage of development between adolescence and and early adulthood which we call emerging adulthood 
emerging adulthood is, is a period of development which spanning from about 18 to 29 or even early 30s. This is the term introduced by Arnett, and it's actually experienced mostly by people living in Western culture, but in many other places too. So uh, emerging adulthood, of course, um, is very much defined by demographic outline. So um, why is it so? Because now the education page ma takes much longer and it's more widespread. People usually uh, get married much later. They start being parents also much, much later. And all these elements actually create space between adolescence and young adult. Probably you are still in this, uh, you are still emerging adults, uh, but it's very important also to understand uh, that it's all connected very much with, with some individual and cultural differences. So our experiences man, may vary by, by gender, by race, by ethnicity, by social or economic or family uh, resources. So it can look very different in different cultures. But generally, uh, the origins of, and the historical influences of emerging adulthood, uh, according to Arnett, uh, is a result actually of four changes in our society, changes which, which occurred in the 60s and 70s. We know that there were really like four revolutions, like technology revolution, the sexual revolution, the women's movement, the youth movement. All these elements, actually, all these radical changes, actually, uh, caused the, that um, that people people actually stayed longer in in uh, in this adolescence time, actually. So, as a result of these radical changes, that you can say that the arrival of uh, fledged adulthood has been delayed, and it's quite visible, especially in in Western culture. So nowadays, when we think about adulthood, um, there are three big criteria of adulthood. First of all is to accept responsibility for yourself. Um, when you feel responsible for yourself, it means that you have become an adult. It's making independent decisions too, and also becoming uh, financially independent. But the most important step towards adult is actually mental maturity. So the, the ability to think for ourselves. Because when we are the, when we when we grow older, adults and, and society usually ex accept our, expect us to make our own decision. And you can't make a decision that if you are not um, mature enough. So maturity is actually the element which um, which makes us adult. So this emerging adulthood is a new stage and it's not an easy stage. Uh, I should just talk about uh, teenagers and adolescents, but because, you know, uh, the stage um, is between the adolescence and the adulthood, very often there are lots of emotions which are typical for, for teenagers at that time. First of all, Emerging adulthood means excitement because, you know, you, you can feel free, you can do what you want. You know, there's so many opportunities for you. But on the other hand, there is this uneasiness. The wide open possibilities also create confusion, especially that we live in an um, overstimulated world. There are so many stimuli and so many opportunities. Very often people feel confused. Uh, I'm a psychotherapist and I really work a lot with young adults graduated from university, college, but they still don't know really what they want to do in their life. And they feel lost in a way. So on one hand, we have new freedoms, but on the other hand, we have new fears. And they feel the pressure uh, of not being able to complete, you know, some tasks, some, some roles, which uh, they should complete. So it's not an easy time. And we talk about just five characteristics which are common to people between these ages 18 29 the first one is identity exploration so this is actually the age of identity exploration so young people try to answer the question who am i they are decided who they 
they, they try to decide who they are and what they want out of work, school, love. So this is the big question. This is also the, the age of instability, especially um, the first five school years are marked by, by repeated uh, residence changes where young people go either to college or they then they live with friends, they live with their romantic parents. Uh, some of them, after the high school, they go back to it, uh, or after college, they, they go back to live with their parents. So it's a big instability, and they also change the place of residence quite quite often. Self-focus, age of self So young people try to decide what they want to do, where they want to go, who they want to be with. Um, it's a specific moment when you feel really free of the parent, of the society, and you can, you can decide really what you want to do, where you want to go. And your choices are not really limited by any constraints like marriage, children, and, and career. So you can really focus on yourself. But on the other hand, this is the age of feeling in between in transition because you are neither an adolescent nor an adult. So many uh, emerging adults, um, they are taking responsibility for themselves, but they don't completely feel like adults. I don't know if you have your, yourself, if you have experienced that, but it's not, it's not that uh, easy. And also this is the age of possibilities, lots of optimists, you know, when you have lots of hopes, you have plans. And you believe that you have good chances to have a better life, very often a better life than your parents had. Uh, and it's great because then you have lots of energy to, to pursue with all these plans and, and uh, ideas. In this time, we also observe some cognitive development. You know, uh, one of the first theories of cognitive development in early adulthood uh, originates uh, with, Il, uh, with William Perry. He studied for many years undergraduate students at Harvard University. And he noted that over college years, cognition tended to shift from dualism, where you think in black and white, right and wrong, this kind of thinking, or absolute thinking. Then you go to um, recognize that, uh, that some problems are solvable, but still there are some problems which we can't solve at the moment. So multiplicity. And then there was a shift to relativism. So understanding the importance of specific contexts of knowledge. So everything is relative to the fact. And similar to Piaget, the formal operation of thinking in adolescence, which, um, I guess uh, you know, or it was also talked about earlier, uh, this change in thinking in adults is very much affected by education experience. So when people um, study when they when they learn, they can uh, progress with this uh, cognitive development. So we talk then about post formal thought, and post formal thought very often described as flexible, logical, willing to accept some moral and intellectual complexity. So it's very different from the previous stages in in development, and it's it's important because uh, when you when you work with people and this uh, emerging adulthood, it's also our task to help them to shift from, from dualist to relativist and, and show them how, how complex is our world and there are no simple answers. So when you look at them at this uh, stage, of course, there are some negatives and there are some advantages of this new life, life stage of emerging adulthood. Uh, like always, there is no one there, there is no one positive thing, but then this new stage of of and uh, of other adulthood has really spread, especially rapidly in the past fifty years. But it's still continuing to spread. So, what does it mean really? On the one hand, it means that young people are much more dependent or much longer dependent on their parents, and because they very often come back to live with parents. And there was a research done in the United States which, which showed that people after college came back to live with their parents seven times before really get, getting settled down. Uh, very often, you know, they, they, change, they change jobs so then they have no place to, to live. They go back to parents or they split up with their partners. So they, 
Again, they have to go and move, live somewhere else. So lots of different things. So it means that they are more dependent on their parents, but they, it, in the past, definitely it took much shorter. Of, of, uh, besides, uh, it takes much longer for young people, for young adults to be fully, you know, involved in, in the community life, to be fully uh, contributing uh, members of society because the education takes much long, longer. And many of them have trouble sorting through the opportunities which are available to them. So many of them will struggle with anxiety and depression because they don't know if you have you know, too many choices. Sometimes we really don't know. This is actually the, the choices we, we are facing now and now this. On the one hand, there's something good, but, the, uh, but on the other hand, it's not that good because we are somehow lost because you don't know what to choose and, and, and what to do in your life. But of course, um, there are some positives, there are some advantages to, to having this new life stage as well. Because by waiting until at least late twenties to take on uh, the full range of responsibilities, young people uh, can obtain better education. They can train themselves for for the demands of of today's information and technology based economy. So they can really educate themselves better. But on the other hand, it is a big challenge for the governments and educational system to create more possibilities, more opportunities for young adults to study, to learn, you know, to increase their level of knowledge. You know, uh, at the moment we, we can observe a uh, lot of specialization. So it's not enough just to graduate from the university. Then you have to take many different courses, you know, to become a specialist. We are narrowing it more and more. Um, so this is uh, the positive thing, but also I think if it takes much longer to make the most important crucial decisions about your love, about your work, maybe, maybe you can be more mature choosing and maybe the choices uh, will, last, will last longer. But it's very individual, of course. So it's difficult to say if it's only positive or negative, but, uh, but we must be aware of that, working with young adults. Because this emerging adulthood, it has a big effect on adult education. I know that there will be more talks about uh, educate uh, adults, but from psychological point of view, uh, it's important to know that this is also a very uh, sensitive period uh, in our life. And when you look at your friends, maybe or uh, students or people you work with or you know, you can see that it's it's also very challenging. So what's important? Um, Shas has talked a lot about affiliation and all the social relationship and contact. And it actually doesn't change when we get uh, young adults, when we doesn't change all our life. But throughout this stage, social relationships, especially family, peer, and also teachers or leaders, they play a really, really important role in how young people can develop the, the autonomy and well-being. There's lots of uh, research on the correlation between uh, autonomy and well-being. That truly, you know, that the term well-being is is recent has recently been very popular. We talk about well-being over everyone. It's good. Sometimes it's overused a little bit. But when we talk about well-being, it refers just shortly optimal psychological state. So, and this is a, a uh, in psychology. This is the construct which may be defined from two complementary perspectives. One is hedoning and the other one eudaimonic. Hedoning perspective perceives uh, frames frames well being as a positive a positive assessment of your own life and it's usually connected or refers to satisfaction and emotional stability. And you 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 look at the subjective well being but Eudaimonic well-being corresponds to psychological well-being in a slightly different way because this emphasizes personal development, self-fulfillment, exploring one potential, planning, which and also taking care of the well-being of other people. And this moment when we become adults, young adults, it's also important uh, to look at well-being from this eudaimonic perspective because it means that you explore your own potential and your self-fulfillment. Um, so 
what can we do to provide uh, support for, for young elders, for emerging adults? Uh, there are many, many ideas, many techniques, of course, but I think that what is really vital is a person-centered education. It's nothing different than probably, you know, being a teacher and working with teenagers. But so when you are, uh, when you are a young adult, you really need the support and you need this uh, personal center education means that you focus on some basic key questions because there are many approaches, many models, but what, what is really, what is really important is to answer some really basic questions. First question, who you are, you know, actually the question we ask ourselves all our life, because even when you are in you, when you are in your elder years, sometimes you don't know who you are. But who you are, there are lots of psychological tests, models, and you can, you can be psychologically diagnosed, get your psychological profile, and to learn what is really important, what support you need to achieve things which are important to you. Um, basic questions, not complicated, uh, seem not, not to be complicated, but they are really complicated because people sometimes uh, try very find it very difficult to really to find answers to this question. There are many, as I said, many models, many, many techniques, uh, which allow us to find out who am I, but I think especially in the emerging adulthood, one of the most important things, uh, is cognitive strategies. As you probably know, cognitive strategies, uh, are sets of some mental process that, that are consciously implemented to regulate, regulate, regulate processes and content in order to achieve goals or solve problems. Uh, there's a definition and cognitive strategies are very much connected with our thinking styles. Everybody has a different thinking style. And in, um, in the cognitive uh, psychology, um, the models and, and the theories tell that, uh, we can, um, we can use different perspectives, especially when you are in a, in a new situation or you can, you have to solve a problem then everybody will use a different strategy. As I said, there are many theories and models, but for instance, one of them uh, tells you which perspective you use when you really have to face a challenge, well, face, uh, face a challenge when you have to solve a new situation. There are four perspectives. Uh, one of them is the green one, when you mainly, when you focus on some facts, let's say that you have to solve a new situation, or you have to make a decision. So this person with this perspective will, will concentrate mainly on some facts. So you just look at the most important facts and you make a decision. The other person, this one, uh, is much more focused on ideas. So this is the person who will create lots of visions, will, you know, elaborate on some alternatives, which solution is better, which is worse, what to do about it. Completely different. The third one, blue one, this is the person who will explore all details. This person is like, you know, investigator, like it, uh, he analyzes all details and the process of making a decision will take much longer because he needs to collect, gather all, even all small details before making a decision. And the fourth one, the art. This is the person who focuses mainly on the relations, relations between different acts, ideas, but also relations between people. So, um, this person before making any decision will think about relationships, with other people, uh, relations between some facts and ideas. And it also, um, uh, this is the person who thinks very emotionally. So it's difficult for, for the person to, uh, to distance himself from the emotions he feels about the new situation. So cognitive strategies uh, and knowing them are connected with some natural predispositions we have. Strategies uh, for dealing with new situations, solving problems. And it's good to remember that thinking styles are not changing throughout our life. They're all the same all our life. It might be surprising for you, but you know, we learn them when we are kids and through all our life, we have the same thinking styles. The only thing which changes is the acting style because we act, we behave differently depending on the situation, on the context, on the role we play in, uh, at work or at home. 
So this is the moment when young people can discover, you know, what are they predispositions, what uh, what is their potential. Because it's important also for their teamwork. You know, when you work in any company, you need to know what are your strengths, how to improve teamwork, how to improve dynamics, team, team dy dynamics, or improve in collaboration. So for us as teachers or leaders, the main uh, goal, especially in the first phase, is to develop a deeper understanding of themselves uh, and, uh, at young adults. So to help them to understand what are the current strengths, what are the interests, skills, passions. And as I said, it's not very easy, uh, but um, we have lots of tools to discover our strengths, especially thanks to positive psychology, Martin Seligman and the others. We have some uh, tools like VIA Character Strength Survey, which you can take for free uh, online, and it will show you what are your strengths, because the strengths can be very different. This can be skills such as maths, drawing, swimming, or just positions, predispositions, such as patience, leadership, ability, many others. So it's important to ask, so what do you really love to do? Because very often, you know, people choose their studies, they choose the university because their parents wanted them to go there. And it's not necessarily their own choice. And then when you are a young adult, uh, I have lots of patients like that. For instance, I, I, I just started to have sessions with, with a, a guy who is 28 and he studied law. And suddenly he discovered that absolutely he doesn't want to be a lawyer not for him and it doesn't go with his personality at all you know but he likes a completely different thing so it's good to discover your strengths you can if you teach uh you can use even some games i often when you when you work with a group it's good to to use the names of the strengths you can take them from this survey which is uh, available online and then each person in that group just gives some strengths to the other participants of the group and then uh, everybody who received the strengths from other participants uh, has to comment and, and say what he thinks about the strength. There are many other techniques, like, you know, you can... Uh, uh, you, can uh, you can use some story cards, you know, like connected with leisure time, for instance, when um, people will tell stories about their best period, their, you know, a day on the beach, different things. They are just exactly something that aroused you, a curiosity, whatever. A day I did something I thought I couldn't do, but I did. And the, the whole group needs to listen to the stories and then tell the person what they feel, what they st what their strengths are. Because when you listen to people telling their the stories, giving you uh, their narrative, you can really tell a lot about this person. And it can be a very useful feedback. You know, when you learn about other people's uh, perspective. Sometimes it's good to ask some extra questions just to make it more clear. I like the examples here, who you were with, how did you feel, how did it look like, you know, you know the questions very well, you can prepare them. You can go also for story cards, connect to work uh, and explore, you know, some situations connected with or work, which which sometimes are very different because, you know, some people behave completely differently at work and completely differently at home because of some fears they face. So if you ask some questions, you can all also help young people to discover their strengths. Maybe, maybe they are not aware of them, but they have them and they can use them in different contexts later on. There are lots of tools and materials. One of them is like, you know, you can even, there is a, the, the link here. Uh, some cards prepared like by Strength Academy, which you can uh, which you can use and buy. I don't know really how it works, but but it can be very helpful to use in the classroom. So the most important questions uh, for young adults, for emerging adults, is to answer the questions like, "What do people like and admire about you? Who are the most important people in your life? What is important to you now and in the?" what is working in your life and what is not working so well. Again, they, they seem to be very easy, but it's not that easy to answer that. And again, you have you can use lots of different tools, strategies. Uh, for instance, like and admire the tool when you talk about positive qualities. 
uh, of the person and then you ask them to think about their strengths, how they can use their strengths in community life, in a group they are part of. Think differently about your strengths because we more or less we are all, all aware of our strengths, but just go one step forward. Think how can you use them differently. Another one is to create a relationship map. When you draw a map and you just uh, draw some relationships which are important in your life, and then you can have a conversation about the relationship. Why are they important? What, what do you value about that? And next one, what is important to, what is important for? Because when you work in a person-centered way, you have to see the person first. So this is a big difference. First, you have to see the person. So what matters to them, not what just what what just what the matter is with them. This is the big difference. What matters to them, not just what the matter is with them. Uh, you see the person, you focus on the person. Working, not working, again, looking at the problem, at the situation from different perspectives. Have a debate, have a discussion. Because sometimes we are just like, you know, in a tunnel. Psychologically, this, this is like the cognitive trap when you go forward and you don't see any other perspective. And the, and the tunnel leads you sometimes not to the best choice. So discussing uh, the situation from different perspective, perspectives can give lots of information and help you with making a good choice. And also, you know, thinking about your outcomes as, or, you know, stimulating young people to think about the outcomes. So what they want to do in the future and what is important for them. So looking at this, uh, looking at this uh, page, you know, you can reflect a little bit because when we are children, or when we are kids, we want to grow up quickly as, and you look at uh, for next birthday. But then when you really get into this moment, when you can do everything, you can, you can drive, you can buy a car, you can, you can vote, you can drink, you can date, you can marry or whatever, then, um, the situation looks completely different. And of course, this can be a very awesome time in our lives because we tend to be physically and cognitively strong and healthy and make some plans for the future. We can dream. You can also find people or person you want to share your experience with. But on the other hand, it can also be a very challenging, stressful and scary time because we realize that freedom goes with responsibility. So you have freedom, but on the other hand, you also have to be responsible for many things which you haven't been till that, that, that moment. So uh, adulting is not easy, uh, and some people are really taking uh, very cautious and, and, and uh, small steps forward it. But when you work with uh, young adults and, and you know that they are facing some fears, now, five ways which are really very important to cope with fear of adulting. First, of, first one is to go toward what really sparks your interest. Ask yourself what you really, what I really want. What is my interest? Have I graduated from the university I really wanted to go? Because sometimes, as I said, we do many things which we didn't want to, and uh, all these elements of self-efficacy of of uh, internal lack of control are very important in this time. Don't feel like a victim of in external circumstances. You need to have the internal lack of control. So you choose, you have influence on your life. And sometimes not knowing what you want to do in life can prevent you from moving forward. So, you know, you are stuck because you don't know what to do. So again, this is the task for this moment, for this stage, just to reflect what you really want in your life. Know that you are not alone, build community. I know that Charles and many others have talked a lot about relationships and it's really, it's really, really important, especially nowadays when, when we actually transformed into, into digital world and that real relationships are not that easy. And uh, the mental health population of people has deteriorated drastically. And I think if we don't invest into relationships, in real meetings with people, it will be even worse. You know, the, the World uh, Health Organization uh, published that by 2030, the first 
um, illness, which will cause death, will be depression. And by 2050, we'll have a new disease, not so social disease, but just the disease, it will be loneliness. So we really need to build communities. And this is the moment when, when you will become a part of different communities and organizations. And remember that your well-being is correlated with the sense of autonomy. This is also important. If you want to cope with fear, it's good to know that if you are more autonomous, you have influence, you have impact on your life. And also seek help for some issues which are holding you back because there is always somebody who can help you. So summing up, um, I would say that adulting is not easy, it's hard. And probably you have seen uh, uh, copy marks of t-shirts worn by teenagers or young adults with the, with the uh, claim, adulting is hard, I can't adult today. And I think many of us can't adult or doesn't want, don't want to adult today because it's great to be a teenager when you have uh, support of your parents, from your teachers and everybody else. But then suddenly you need to take responsibility for your own life and become an adult. And believe me, this is challenging, but it also gives us lots of freedom, lots of food, and lots of fantastic energy. So it's good to use it properly. And if you teach young adults, remember about if you are a young adults, use it also for your own sake. Oh, I, I had only 30 minutes, so I hope I managed to get it all on time. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Alicia, for your wonderful session. And I want to wear that t-shirt as well. I can't <laughs> add out today. Yeah, I just want to be teenager for, for a day. So we have got a few questions from teachers. Um, the first one is about, can, could you please provide some explanations on the two complementary perspectives on well-being? You mentioned that two yeah. perspectives, right? Could you please explain yeah. a little bit? Yes, there, is, there are two perspectives. One is hedonic and one is eudaimonic. Hedonic, as you probably know, is more associated with pleasure, with, feel, with you know, being uh, in, a, in a situation, in a state of pleasure. But um, uh, in, in, especially in positive psychology, we, we try to complement this hedonic perspective with eudaimonic. So when you, when you look at your well-being from hedonic perspective, you will more look at some satisfaction at, you know, completing some uh, short-term goals, something like that. But then when you think about eudaimonic perspective, it's more connected with, with having a sense of meaning. So you need to have a sense of meaning. You need to know that what you do makes sense. Um, and it's connected also with, with well, exploring one potential, with, with planning for future. But it's not enough to feel great just now. But you plan for something that will, will be significant and meaningful in your life. So this sense of meaningful is important. And also, you know, um, recent studies have underlined the differences between these two perspectives by examining the links to a different character strengths. So such uh, strengths as hope, gratitude, curiosity, they are very much correlated with this two perspective. So if you have such strengths like gratitude or curiosity, probably your perspective will be more eudaimonic because uh, you are grateful uh, for all you have in your life and you plan for future and you also respect other people's life and their well-being. You know, there's lots of literature that I can, I can talk for two hours about this well-being, but just, you know, in a nutshell, I can explain like that. Yeah. Yes, I think like a short-term happiness versus maybe long-term. Yeah, maybe for teenagers, we, we start to enjoy the short-term ones, but we need to learn to how to yeah, develop ourselves to gain like long-term well-being in the, yeah, in the second perspective, right? Yes, even with teenagers, you know, of course we need both because the, it's not that one is better, one is worse. But you need to hear yeah, yeah. that, but you need to feel happy. Yeah? So this hedonic, it's actually, it has some philosophical roots when you go back to philosophy. Started first, we have hedonics, then we, then we went more for eudaimonic perspective. And eudaimonic, like using the potential. So even when you work with teenagers, it's good to show them that they, they, they could use their potential. They can do something. 
which will make this uh, their life more meaningful and significant. Yes. Yeah. Being aware of that two perspectives is really, really, I think, uh, helpful and inspirational.